Scene one, Apple, take one. I'm Shane Borza and welcome to another episode of Film Notes, the show where I interview people in the industry about the industry. I'm really excited today. I have one of my great friends, Mike Fitzgerald, with us. He's an editor. He has a lot of background in various roles, so we're going to discuss how he got in the industry, what he's done in the industry, where he's at now. And of course, we're going to also get into his notes about editing, both if you're interested in doing that yourself or if you're interested in hiring an editor to help you with your projects. So without further ado, Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you for having me. So I wanted to get a little background from you as a beginning here. How and when did you get interested in film? I am one of those rare people that when I was like five, I knew <clears throat> what I wanted to do and make movies. Of course, I didn't know what people did and because ever you know the directors the author I was like oh I want to be an actor slash director slash you know just make the whole movie um but then you know having later much later come out of film school I kind of realized the direct directing's hard um it's very hard and it's very stressful and I did a little bit of it with shorts and things uh so a fr a mutual friend of ours Chris uh, got me my first job out of college and it was in post-production. So that's kind of where my actual career started. And though I've done a lot of other things, um, that's kind of been my bread and butter. You kind of get, you know, you take what comes and, and if you like it, you stick with it. And the things I didn't like, I didn't keep applying for those jobs and, and I, I liked editing. So that's what I've been doing. Now, how did you go from being a kid and wanting to make movies to going to film school and making those connections so you could start working? So a lot of people will besmirch film school because it's expensive. There's, you know, you don't necessarily need formal learning to learn how to make a movie. You could just start to try to get jobs on set or in post-production or whatever. For me, the value, in you know, is that it it opened uh, a lot of connections for me. You don't need to pay a lot of money and go to a school, a building and stuff to learn how to use, you know, Premiere Pro or a camera or even today's, you know, with, with this, everybody has a camera, right? When we were young, <clears throat> you had to go buy a camcorder and nobody, nobody had had editing software, you know, that was very expensive. And now that it's all free, I think, to me, the value of film school was was like just meeting other people that were interested in that and kind of coming of age together at the same time creatively. And a lot of those people I've gone on to work with or at least keep in touch with. And some of those people in my class are, you know, Emmy winning creators. It's really like the environment I think can be useful for film school. It's, I, it, you know, if you just want to go learn the logistics of it, try not to pay for it because there's a lot of free tutorials online um books you know you can get or just try it try it and 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 fail and try and fail and try and fail make a short but if you want to be like you know surrounded by other people that are passionate about what you are that's a good reason to go to school for it or join a club for it you know i would say the the other real value for me will of film school was film theory and film history and having, you know, really well-versed professors, you know, ask us interesting questions, like show us a film I would never have seen, um, a foreign film or, a, or an old film or an art house film, and then just start the discussion, the discussion uh, amongst the group. And the other really valuable thing was feedback because it's kind of hard, you know, you and I both also write scripts sometimes and it's easy to sit in a room and write a script by, by, by yourself but it's really hard to get honest feedback especially for free um, from people and so a real value of having a department in classes where you can be around people that are doing what you want to do you can give each other that feedback that was a huge part of class was um, especially with the writing 
the screenwriting classes, um, you would present your work, everybody would have read it, you people would give you notes, you discuss it, and you would learn by just falling on your face a lot of times and seeing how other people fell on their faces and seeing how other people succeeded. And those communities of feedback, that can be hard to arrange on your own sometimes. <clears throat> it's possible. I'm also, you know, I did writing groups just off of Facebook where there were there were uh, Facebook people that would get together and, and share scripts. Or you can get, you know, you can start a group of sh short filmmakers and, and show each other your rough cuts and things like that and get notes. But I think the value of being in an institution uh, like, an, you know, whether it's film school or art school or music school is that feedback from other people. I don't think, you know, is it worth the money <clears throat> or the time to learn, you know, where to put the camera? N no, that's something you don't really, you know, you could probably do on your own, but it's those communities, the feedback communities and just the discussion, you know, I mean, think of like, ancient Greece they would just stand around talking and that's how a lot of ideas came about and showing each other your films it reminds me of like if you've seen this documentary about Scorsese and Spielberg and I forget who else was in that group Coppola and some other people Milius or something they kind of just got together a lot when they were younger and just shared their work and gave each other notes and I think that's very very valuable um, whether you're in editing or you know set design or whatever department you're in. I did want to talk now about how you were able to transition from film school to making some shorts, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. and then learning that your <clears throat> interest might be more in post-production. So how did you go from like graduating and finishing to getting your projects going and then learning? I want to focus on this one area. I think for all of the students, all of my peers, what happened after <clears throat> school was just a continuation where that's what we had been doing for four years in school was making projects, making short projects, working on each other's projects, hanging out, watching movies, talking about movies. Um, and when you graduate, you get a job, whether it's, you know, at a pizzeria or maybe you're lucky and you get <clears throat> a job related to movies, which I did not get right away. It took, a, I think, half a year before I got, um, a, an industry job but in the spare time you're just you know I was in my young 20s and that's what we did with all of our spare time was just making stupid shorts um I remember you came you visited me for like 12 hours when I was living in the Upper West Side and I had a, I had Charlie's camera I had my roommate's camera and we said let's make a short film okay what should we make it about I don't know let's just think of something and 10 minutes later we started filming I remember showing there was pitch and people loved that it was this dumb little short film but uh we shot it in like real time 20 minutes I edited it the week later you know so you just kind of an idea comes to you the ones that are expensive you usually dismiss and you the ones that you think you can shoot next week you just start working on it and your friends are all working on movies too so then hey I I didn't really know how to be a DP. I still don't, but I loved reading American Cinematographer, which I had been reading since high school. And I, my friends were looking for somebody to, to light their shorts because they didn't really know how to use the camera. So then that was an opportunity where, hey, all right, all the stuff I was reading about in American Cinematographer, I don't have that money and I don't have you know those, those people, but I can start to apply and try it out on somebody's short and there's there's low stakes you don't want to waste people's time and everything but it's a chance to just tr learn you know learn by doing so yeah i think for i think it's maybe true of any um i'm sure it's different in other professions where you go to school and you learn the theory right and then you have no real maybe an internship or something and then you go out in the world and then they're like hey everything you learned in school throw that away it's wrong um I didn't find that to be the case. A lot of the stuff I learned in school wasn't useful on set because like, I'm not the director, right? So like, I'm not gonna use film theory or I'm not gonna like create the shots, but I did use that stuff when I was 
shoot, you know, directing my own shorts um, or, or giving feedback to my friends. Uh, so it really was just an extension of, you know, school was about making projects and trying things. And when we got out of school, uh, I was living in New York City for, I think, 17 years and didn't have kids, didn't have a lot of obligations beyond work. So we just spent a lot of time making stuff. So then the question is, how do you bridge that from hobby to a profession? How do you get paid for it, right? I think it's all kind of word of mouth. I have been, it's been almost 20 years since I graduated college. I think two jobs I've ever had were like cold applications, you know, where I sent in my application. And one of those was only, I only got hired because it was in a town near where we grew up. So I knew the area and I could borrow my dad's car and be a PA and drive Tony Danza around to set because I knew the area and I had a car. So they hired me. 98 out of a hundred jobs I've had are word of mouth. Don't take the small jobs lightly because you may not care about that job. <clears throat> you may not care about that show or that movie, but if you impress your boss, your boss will notice and will take you on the next project or recommend you for another project. There was one job I was hired as PA for a movie and it was a lot of fun, but I tried my best, even though I was getting paid $40 a day and had to pay for my own gas and all that and was working 18 hour days. Um, but I tried my best and I, and I think I impressed my boss because he called me up a few months later and said, hey, I'm working on a TV show, we need a PA come on in. And I did that for a few days. That was actually where I had a chance to go into the field because they hired me as a field PA. It was a show called Shalom in the Home, which was a pretty good show. This rabbi would drive around and give advice to families. And they hired me as a field PA. And I did a couple days as that, but I kind of hated it. I mentioned to my boss, who was the production manager, I said, you know, by the way, if you ever need anybody when we're finished if you ever need anybody in the office I also have post-production experience he said oh really well what the hell are you doing here like get back, get back to New York so they sent me back to New York I started as an assistant editor working nights and then you know I tried my best to impress that boss and he brought me onto another show after that and those people then hired me you know it's this snowball effect it's it's like you're creating more links in your chain and then that's that's why they call it a network, I guess, right? And then it's just word of mouth. That's what it is. It's word of mouth. You know, people ask around, like the job I'm on now, which I've been on off and on for like seven years as an editor, my friend, I was at a bar with him having a drink and I was between jobs and I was looking forward to a month off, but he said, actually, my show just lost an editor. Uh, you should email, you should email this guy. And I did, and they hired me kind of as a test and it worked out. What's the day-to-day -day of an editor? What's the tools of an editor? You know, how are you actually doing the editing work? For a lot of jobs, it's very much a team effort. I mean, obviously film is collaborative. Everything's a team effort, but post-production really is a lot of moving parts. To give you an example, I started out as a tape loader, which is like, we don't do that anymore because everything's on digital, but like you used to have to physically load a tape into a machine so it would get digitized, right? That's a job. You work your way up from that. You're an assistant editor who organizes all the footage inside whatever system you're using. That's a job, you know? And then you have the editors who generally, their job is to creatively take all the footage and make something wonderful out of it. So I logistically, you know, day to day, what does an editor do? Well, they sit in front of a computer. So it's not, you're not on your feet, like on set. Uh, they sit in front of a computer and you pick up where you left off on the show or the movie. Um, there's hundreds of hours of footage probably that they've shot. Like right now I'm working on a TV series. The episodes are an hour long to 42 minutes long. They probably shoot 50 hours of footage for that one hour. And it's the editor's job based on a script that somebody has put together in this case it's a it's a producer because it's a non-fiction show it's a documentary show the producer puts together a script we look at the script we lay out those interview bites right in a line this is what they want this interview bite then there's this narration then there's this interview bite, then there's this narration 
actually an assistant editor usually does that for us. And then we come on and you could just watch talking heads as they say, right? But you wanna work in music, you wanna work in footage, you wanna work in B-roll. And we have a lot of photos on this show. It's a documentary. So there's like photos of the event and old video. So it's our job to decide what to show when. Um, I think there's an old adage that, oh, editing, that's removing the bad parts. That's easy. I'd say it's completely the inverse. Editing is deciding what are the good parts and what order should I put them in? And then finessing it uh, for length, for polish, for smoothness. Um, you want it to be dramatic. You want it to have you want it to be dynamic so it's you know there's there's fast parts my boss is always telling us you know the roller coaster with the music especially it's got to be like fast and exciting and then slow and and creepy or sad or whatever it is and then fast and you know you want it to be dynamic so you know going through all the footage choosing laying out like what shot goes after what shot what should I put here and like anything like writing it goes in stages so you have your rough cut you know, then you'll get notes on that from people. You'll change the things that they tell you to change and then you'll polish it again. You'll have your fine cut, you'll have your final cut. And then it goes off to technical people who, you know, mess with the color and the sound and stuff to like finalize that. I like you talked about the difference between onset and post-production. I think that's something that a lot of people don't understand is the production part is just the first part. You know, everyone shows up and the actors and everything do every, <clears throat> they hit their lines and <clears throat> get the footage. And then sometimes, especially with a movie, it might be in post-production for a year or more. And yeah. the, the magic, so to speak, is what's happening in small rooms. Like, well, lot, in terms of scripted, a lot of directors started out as editors because it's storytelling. You know, obviously it depends whether it's scripted or non-scripted or, or if it's reality TV versus a game show versus whatever, but like they're all different, you're gonna have a different approach. You just wanna tell the story that people are expecting to see. You have to match the style of the show or the genre. Like you're talking about production, like imagine where there's 200 people that are gonna make a dinner at a restaurant and you have a photo of what the dish should look like, right? What the recipe should look like. So then you send a bunch of people off to source that, to go to the farms and the whatever and get the honey and get the stuff and bring it back. That's production. They're going, they're shooting the stuff, they're getting the footage, making a lot of decisions along the way as to what they're getting. But now you just have a hard drive, right? Or a kitchen full of like food ingredients. So now in the, ki in the kitchen, you need somebody to like put it together and decide, well, what goes with what? And like, which turnip is, you know, you have like six takes of the same thing. Well, they're all very different. Some obviously are bad. But some are just different. There's a famous interview with Scorsese's editor where she's talking about Casino and she has like five takes just of the close-up of the dice rolling. And she's like, well, I have to watch each one and like figure out which one is the best. And then like, or do I combine them, you know? So I think that it's sort of like that, you know, the production is collecting and, and creating the content that you could choose from, but then the editor and the sound designer and all the post-production people are choosing, like putting it together into something. So it's not just, you know, hundreds of hours of footage sitting on a hard drive. Like, well, what, what are you gonna build out of it, you know? And how are you gonna, like I said, it, it's in, in how are you gonna continually finesse it, polish it, shorten it. So it is the length you want it and it is the length that the story wants to be. So we just learned a little bit more about your history in the industry and your background in editing. I did want to talk a little bit about what you are using to edit. Do you have any software you either have used or are currently using or any recommendations you might have for people that might be interested in learning to edit? I use Avid, A-V-I-D. That is an industry standard for broadcast, um, feature films, things like that, commercial. The strength of Avid is that you can put a lot of footage into it. You can put thousands of hours of footage into, you know, different folders and bins and keep it organized. The other main value is it's collaborative. So some of the other softwares like Premiere, Final Cut, you can collaborate with other editors and you can, you know, you can have 
other people working on the same project, but Avid is kind of the like, I think the strong, the most robust software for that. You can have like, we have six editors on this show working every day on the same, you know, same episode, different parts of the episode, um, plus four assistant editors and a color correctionist. So, and you could have shows with like 20 people logging into the same project that is very useful so that's why you'll see avid used a lot in something where there's like maybe 20 episodes or something or you know for our show there's like scores of old episodes that sometimes we have to access so in terms of like the media management and the collaboration avid is probably what people would be using um however that is only you know part of the job sector would be you know broadcast and commercial there's a huge employment opportunity out there for smaller things or indie uh things where you might be the only editor on it so for a lot of that stuff people use premiere final cut shane i know that you said you use davinci and there's probably 12 other softwares out there some of them some of which are free i'm sure when you buy your computer like um iMovie or whatever. My advice would be if you're trying to learn how to edit, then you could get Avid. It's a lot cheaper now. It used to cost $5,000 because you had to buy a computer and all these like components. Now it's a lot, it's like Adobe. You can download it and rent it for a month. I don't know. It might be 50 bucks or something. I'm not sure. But I think learning that <clears throat> is a first step. Um, Technically, if you want to go into film, broadcast, um, streaming stuff, you know, major, major things like that. So other than software recommendations, what notes might you have for people who would be interested in getting into editing? And as we've talked about, it's both the art and the science. So there might be some things that would be more technical skills, but there might be some creation things. Can you speak to both of those? Of course. Yeah. You and I have talked before about how, you know, there's the creative aspect and you can't, you know, teach that necessarily, but you can certainly learn it. And then there's the technical aspect, which can be taught, can be learned. Um, it really can be learned people. And I would say, to start with the creative side of it, you know, good editing isn't supposed to be noticed. It's not like costume design where, you know, the awards for costume design are gonna go to like these period pieces where it's pretty obvious that they put a lot of work into like designing and building these costumes. With editing, the awards come up and it's kind of like, well, I don't know, like, well, what did the editor do? You know, what did the editor do on this? Well, that's kind of the point. Like you shouldn't see, it's, it's supposed to be stitching together. Like when you read the newspaper, you shouldn't really notice the writing. It should be very good writing, but you shouldn't necessarily notice it. Um, the editor's job is to draw you into the story. And if you're taken out of the experience of watching the movie or the show, that's probably the editor might've done an awkward cut or, and it's not always their fault or their choice. Sometimes there's, you're very limited in the footage you have and you have no choice but to do a jump cut or, you know, cut somebody off mid-sentence when they're, you know, an interview bite, cut them off in the middle of the word. But the best editing um, under the best circumstances is seamlessly stitching together the experience that the person is watching. So you shouldn't notice it, you know. Um, and that I think that's true whether it's scripted and it's a scene of actors or whether it's a documentary and you know you have the interviewer on screen for a while and then you have to cut to a photo or something like that should flow. I think my advice for learning that is just to number one, watch as much as you can and start noticing it. Instead of watching and, and you know letting yourself just enjoy the story, pay attention to when the filmmaker has changed shots. Pay attention to what music they've chosen to put and how they're transitioning from one music track to another, which sound effects, why they're using like a wide shot and then a close up, or starting with a close up and going to a wide. It's really fun to watch, for instance, the slowed down fight scene and see just how many angles they might have gotten on that, or a chase scene or something, you know, James Bond and 
and just see like how they put that together so that it really flows. So you can watch it and just start paying attention, but really there's no, you know, there's no, uh, there's no substitute for just trying, just practice. So just get some kind of free or cheap set editing software. If you don't have footage from your short film, you can maybe Shane can suggest like a place you can download free footage and just try to start putting something together. And it's really just practice, practice, practice. Switching to the technical side, my advice would be if you can get Avid or something like that, that is a more, um, you know, industry standard, I would try to get that and learn it because a lot of it is just learning the interface of the editing program and where stuff is and how to quickly get the footage. Because if somebody hires you, they want you to be fast. They want you to be good, but they want you to be fast. They don't want to sit around while you're like, oh yeah, how do I put that shot on the other track? Let me, you know, oh no, that's the wrong button. You know, they just want you to like be fast out with it. And that just takes practice. So just start practicing. If you look at it from a client's perspective, from an employer's perspective, if I'm hiring a filmmaker because I want a documentary about my mother or like, I want my YouTube channel to be better. Like I want to hire one person, the one man band, right? I want them to be able to shoot and bring their microphone and get correct sound and light. And if they have an assistant, whatever, that's fine. But like, I don't want to hire like six people you know, I want them to know how to do that. And maybe they even know how to edit and do the whole thing. So from a post-production standpoint, the client wants a one-man band. They don't want to hire, you know, you. And I give you my hard drive of footage. And then you say, well, I can do this stuff, but I can't, you know, I can't do that. And then I give it back and find somebody else to do that. They want to give you their hard, the hard drive. It has all the footage on it. They'll send you the script or whatever. They want you to Take that and come back in a week with something that, you know, is edited, has titles, has some basic graphics that they've asked for. The sound is mixed correctly. You've, you've, you know where to find, you know, music, whether they have a budget for music or you're getting royalty free music, you know, you, you need to know like where those resources are. Shane, I know you have a whole book, right? And website about, for instance, music and like where you can find this stuff it would definitely behoove the would-be editor to learn the graphics side of it. Personally, I have happened to have worked on shows where there's a big enough staff that somebody specifically does our graphics and somebody does the titles and somebody else mixes the sound and somebody else does the color correct. So I'm kind of me and my, and the six other editors, we, we just edit, you know, we take the footage, put it together when it's, finalized we hand it off to other people to do the technical bells and whistles but on a smaller project if you're getting hired off one of these gig websites or you know somebody just wants you to like sizzle up their youtube channel you should know how to do some basic graphics so i would strongly suggest also learning you know after effects is a good one shane what do you recommend for graphics pretty much the adobe suite is a good go-to because not only can you do a deep dive into any particular thing. I mean, they have a separate program for color. They have a separate program for effects. They have a separate program for sound. All of that is in Premiere Pro, but if you wanna go super deep, it kind of explodes out, but it's all Premiere based. So they all plug into each other. So that's really easy. One of the things I like about DaVinci is that they kind of have that similar thing, but it's all within that one program. So they have like five different sections, but you just get DaVinci and it's all within the one. Premiere, they have like a, like a meta gig torrent type thing where you can get access to like every app they have. And that's great. Or you can just get them piecemeal and say, hey, I just need Premiere to edit in and I need After Effects to do effects in, and that's all I'm gonna use you still have those tabs and things kind of like in Final Cut. It's not as robust. So Premiere might be the easiest thing for people to start with because they can take uh, one program at a time. Going back to Avid, I love Avid. I love working in Avid. It's my favorite editing program. I don't want to trash talk it, but in terms of, it, it is a really good software for just like straight editing, just like we're getting a bunch of video, we're getting a bunch of audio, putting it together. It does have a great sound mix actually, but for effects, it's not the greatest out there. 
it does have like we do a lot of stuff on our show where we'll apply a lot of filters to shots you know individual shots to like change the color or do a cool transition or flop the shot or punch in or whatever but if it's like you're getting hired by a client who wants um oh the wall behind me I want like it'd be really cool if that was on fire right like or like it'd be really cool if like can you put rain effect behind like I would say for that most professionals are probably going to export from Avid and do that in After Effects or Premiere, you know, one of these other programs and pull it back in. So while Avid is great for that, like we have 20 people on the team that all need to use it, or I just have a lot of footage um, and I'm just gonna edit this. If you're doing something that's like more graphics heavy, maybe one of the other editing programs is gonna make more sense. I just keep going back to the client's perspective because that's, you know, at the end of the day, you might be doing this for a hobby, but this show, your podcast is about people, I think, who want to do it professionally. You always have to be thinking of the client. They just want you to say, yes, I can do that. My boss today, we had a soundbite where um, there's the the interviewer and the interviewee, and we, were, we wanted the interviewee to be saying something, but unfortunately, the interviewer was heard talking over because I think starting to ask a question or something. And the note was, please remove the, the junk sound. And I looked at it and I said, well, at first I said, well, sorry, this is embedded in the guy's lavalier mic. I can't really take it out. And then I, I stopped and myself and I said, that's not what my boss wants to hear. <laughs> that's not what he's paying me for. So I did a, what they call a Frankenbite. And, or as I refer to it, it's a lie in service of the truth. He did say this thing, but we didn't have it clean. The word that was being stepped on was the word past. So I go through the, all of our interviews are transcribed. So I go through the word document and I poke around. Well, I, he didn't say the word past again, um, but he did say impact and he did say just. So I took the path from impact and the st from just, and I fiddled around and I have him say past cleanly without anybody stepping on it. So, you know, just think about the client, like they, they just want you to figure it out. And I think whether that's like, hey man, I'm hiring you for this thing. Like you got, I just like, I want you to put titles on it. You know, I want a cool title design and I want subtitles or I want lower thirds with the person's name or I want a cool transition where like, it's a shark show. So like, can we have a shark like bite it? Like, hey, they don't need to know that maybe you went and got help on that. Maybe you outsourced or hired or, or had to go. The great thing about the internet, every the so many people out there want to help each other. So there's all these forums and tutorials. So all the time when I'm working on my, my personal stuff, if there's a graphic I don't know how to do, I'll just look it up. And somebody's probably explained it. There's so many plugins now. I used the example earlier of, oh, what if the wall is on fire? But like, that's actually kind of easy to do nowadays. There's like a lot of the softwares, right? will have like a preloaded template with fire and then you can like kind of morph it or whatever. But knowing that stuff is really going to, get you the jobs because there's a lot of jobs where I didn't feel strong enough about my graphics skills. Um, and I'm not talking about animation. I just mean like titles, basic graphics, you know, backgrounds, things like that. Um, I just didn't get the jobs because I said, look, I'm, I think I'm a good editor, but I'm, I'm not as strong on that stuff. And they went with somebody who, you know, does know that. So, so I think employment wise, learn the editing software, but also learn the graphics and um, you know, maybe you'll find that you like the graphics more and there's jobs out there too, where maybe Shane, you can have like a graphics designer on too at some point to interview or a special effects person. Um, I have a friend, Jared, who that's all he does. He does like special effects for a living and he'll get hired for a few days on a show or a movie or something. And they'll say, we need these effects. He'll do those and then he'll give it back to the editor. I wanted to shift now on putting a spotlight on you and your work. Do you have any places that you'd like people to connect with you, contact you, see some of what you've done, or if you have any work coming up or anyone else to broadcast so people can know about it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, if anybody has any questions, they can contact me through you or you can put my email address on there. I also have a website with some of my professional work. So the show I'm on now, which I've been on off and on for seven years, it's called On the Case 
with Paula Zahn. She's a wonderful documentarian and journalist. That is on Investigation Discovery. So that's aired primetime and then they stream everything as well on their website. For my personal work and some smaller projects I've done, the website is mfeditor.tumblr.com. And I've got, you know, basically this is this is the website um, I'll send people when I'm looking for a job. I will talk about editing reels for a second because I don't know, like in terms of getting a job, people might ask for an editing reel. All the editors I know think it's dumb. Like we don't have editing reels. Um, it doesn't really make sense because like, why would you want like a montage of different shows you've done? Like what I do is I send them a music video or like a short commercial or something that I've cut because then it's short and they can watch it. But it's not like, oh, here's like a shot from a movie I edited, but then it has nothing to do with this other thing I edited and I just put music under it. It's not like an acting reel. Like you want to, I think for an editor, it's, it's way more helpful to just have like some, sh some excerpts or short pieces. So on my site, what I do is I have a reel that I cut for company. It's like the company reel, it's kind of old, but then I have some um, sizzles, which I don't know if you've talked about sizzles on your podcast, but if you're pitching a show or a movie, typically they'll do a sizzle reel, which is some kind of five minute example of the show or kind of it shows the style of the show or it gets people excited about it. And I used to, that was my bread and butter for years. I would cut sizzles, just that that was my job. I would get passed around for different companies cutting sizzle reels, mostly for reality shows that they're trying to get made. So with sizzle is very short, it's five minutes. That's a great thing to use. I think if you're showing a potential employer as a work sample. So that's what my website has. It has music videos, sizzles, excerpts from films and things like that. I've been pretty busy with work and life lately. So I don't have a personal project that I've done in the past year. But let me, if you, if I may shine a light on my friend, his podcast, because this is a gentleman, Dave, my friend, he's another editor on our show. He's my colleague. His podcast is actually about sailing. And I think it's really cool. I am not a big sailor, but I find his show so cool to listen to. So fascinating that I just listened to it. And his podcast is called White Cap. White Cap, the, the Canadian Sailing Podcast. So I strongly recommend checking that out if you're looking for a new podcast. But yeah, thank you so much, Shane, for um, inviting me. And hopefully that was helpful to people. Yeah, you're the first editor on the show. So thank you for diving into some of that. It's fascinating to hear the similarities and differences as we both you know, went to film school and came up in like the indie world and then have branched out you know, over the years. And just before we wrap up, I do want to, you know, we talked about this in passing earlier, but I just wanted to publicly thank you because one of the reasons I am in the film industry is because you went into the film industry. And as I mentioned earlier, I graduated from college and came home to find out you were going to film school. And I was like, you mean I could have done that? <laughs> like, I wish <laughs> I'd done that. And you were like, well, you still can. And so then I did. Yeah. And all that happened because that's what you were doing. And I didn't know that was an option. And so that was a life-changing event for me and now I too have been like in the industry for like 20 years and I always uh, credit you for that so I want to publicly thank you for getting us both into the industry yeah yeah I, I was gonna say ironically the first movie you and I shot together in 1999 was my en entry submission for NYU film school and we didn't have editing back then or I couldn't afford it so we did the in-camera edit we I remember we were shooting and you have to hold the camera hit record the guy says the line you hit stop really fast you change angles hit record hit stop and if you mess up you have to back up and like do it over but it was just linear like in camera editing and how far how far we've come <laughs> well thanks again for being on the show and yes that was my first onset film experience as well which was also great to everyone who's watching Please contact Mike if you want to know more about editing or me, if you want to just know more about the industry. As Mike mentioned, I do have some books and some programs on getting into film and learning more about it. If you'd like to support the show, please watch the web series online. You can also listen to the podcast, which is on Spotify and Anchor FM. And if you'd like to support the show, please go to my Patreon page. All the information is on the screen. This is season two, so I'm excited to have more people coming up. 
season one is already out, so you can check out all the past guests. I'm excited to have all my friends here, not only to learn more about what they do and how they got into what they're doing in the industry, but also to shine a light on their projects. So check out Whitecap, check out Mike's film stuff online, and show up for the next episode, and we'll see you then. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to support the show, please click on the link below. You can also contact me at my website if you have any questions about filmmaking or anything else. Off to the side, you'll see a couple of my books, Film Notes and the Film Notes Workbook. I encourage you to check those out if you'd like to learn more about filmmaking. See you in the next episode. Scene one, Apple, take one.